Chapter 3 Entry Hazards G'day everyone, Rune here, and this is Chapter 3 of my What If Red Was Ash's Father story. If you're new to this series, click the link in the description below to be taken to the playlist. Now let's begin the next chapter. After their unpleasant encounter with Samurai in Viridian Forest, it doesn't take long for our group of heroes to arrive in Pewter City. As they're entering the city, Ash begins thinking about everything that he and his team have at their disposal, trying to figure out a strategy to beat the rock-type gym leader Brock. With Sil being a normal type and Vixie being a fire type, he's at a pretty big disadvantage. But Sil does have the egg move double kick and Vixie has Will-O-Wisp, so maybe they could form a strategy based on that. He's brought out of his thoughts by Marina tapping his shoulder. Looking at her, he sees that she's grinning with laughter in her eyes. She informs him that he was mumbling again, causing Ash to blush. After having a little laugh at her friend's expense, she tells him that before he worries about how to beat Brock, he's first going to need to figure out how he's going to get past the door. Ash tilts his head in confusion, asking what Marina is talking about. You just walk in, don't you? Marina stares at him like he's grown a second head, before informing him that Germs haven't had a just walk in attitude in 15 years. At Ash's panicked and confused expression, she explains, Fifteen years ago, the gym leaders had experienced a great loss in one of their own. In memory of their fallen comrade, they changed the entry requirements of their gyms to reflect the personality and beliefs of their friend. Now, in order to get into the gyms, you need to fulfill their entry task. Usually entailing you have a Pokemon of a specific type on your team or you complete a specific task. Ash asks about the Viridian Gym, pointing out that she never mentioned anything about it when she was encouraging him to take on Blue. Marina explains that the Viridian Gym entry task is simply being in the city at the same time as the gym leader. The guy is away from his gym more often than not, so his entry task is for you to either A. Wait for him to show up, B. Go out and find him, or C. Get lucky and be there at the same time as him. Ash rolls his eyes and folds his arms at that explanation. Yeah, that sounds like the kind of trolley thing Blue would do for an entry task. Since Marina seems to already know what the entry task for Pewter is, he asks, and she explains that the task is to have a Pokemon with a type that is strong against Rock on your team. With Pewter being the first gem on most trainers' Pokemon journeys, Brock had decided to embrace that fact and make his gem a little tutorial for new trainers. She offers to let Ash borrow one of her Pokemon, at least to let him get through the front door. But Ash declines. He tells Marina that his father had tried to make him take one of his Pokemon before his journey even started. If he succeeds or fails, he wants it to be on the merits of him and his Pokemon, not loans given to him by others. Though he would appreciate some help in finding a Water-type Pokemon to catch. Marina beams, her eyes sparkling at the idea of catching some Water-types and helping out her friend. Grabbing his hand, she begins to drag him through Pewter. Quite literally, as Ash struggles not to trip over his own feet with how fast Marina is dragging him. Within minutes, they're standing next to a large river just at the edge of town. Marina grins as she holds a fishing rod in one hand while standing with one foot on a rock, making her look like she's posing for some kind of action comic. She tells Ash that most associate Pewter with rocks and completely forget about the river that runs right near it. But, wherever there's water, there's bound to be water-type Pokémon. Ash looks around at the river as she continues to ramble, wondering what kinds of Pokémon live in this river. His attention is caught by movement further upstream. It looks like a group of people making a racket and throwing things into the river. Ash frowns. Not only would they scare away all of the Pokémon if they keep that up, but they'll make the river too dangerous for them to come back. He taps Marina on the shoulder, cutting off her rambling before pointing towards the group. Without needing to exchange any words, they run towards the group. When they get close, they can see that the group is wearing the same black uniforms as the group that had been harassing Marina. And they're not dumping trash into the river, they're throwing nets at a... Horsey? Why is a horsey in a freshwater river? Spotting one of the thugs preparing to throw another net, Ash shouts for them to leave the poor Pokemon alone. They turn to him and Marina with looks of detached disinterest, and one of them tells them to run along and mind their own business. But then, another one of the thugs focuses on Marina and raises an eyebrow, before turning to his compatriots and asking if she doesn't look familiar. Another thug squints at Marina for a moment before grinning. 
It's not a nice smile. The thug tells his allies that it seems to be their lucky day. Not only did they track down the quote, troublesome pest, but they also found the little girl that escaped Team Gamma. The thug with the net tells the others to capture Marina and Ash while he captures the horsey. He tells them that if Ash is hanging around with the girl, he must have some information on Red as well. And even if they don't, they'll make for good hostages. The other thugs move away from the river, advancing on Ash and Marina. Ash takes a nervous step back, but stops as Marina places a hand on his shoulder. Turning to her, he can see the fire in her eyes that reminds him of Gary. She tells Ash not to worry. They can take these creeps on, no sweat. Marina's confidence calms Ash's nerves and he reaches for his belt, grabbing Vixie's Pokeball while Marina grabs Toties. Together, they call out their Pokemon, while the group of five call out their Zubat. Marina takes the first move, calling for Toady to use Icy Wind. Toady does just that, striking the five Zubat and sending them flying. Following Marina's lead, Ash calls for Vixie to use her own wide area attack, Heat Wave. The sudden change of temperature from freezing cold to boiling hot proves to be too much for the Zubat as they fall to the ground. The thugs are just about to send out more Pokemon when the member behind them tells them that they've got what they need, and all this noise is going to attract attention from the gym leader. They can grab the brats another time. Looking behind the thugs, Ash's heart sinks as he sees the little horsey struggling in the six thugs' net. The thugs all turn on their heels, intending to get away with their prize while they can. With all of them being adults, Ash knows that they'll never be able to keep up with them. But he can't stand the idea of the poor horsey being taken away by them. The poor thing clearly has some kind of history with them and doesn't want to go with them. In desperation, he grabs an empty Pokeball from his belt and throws it at the retreating group. Whether it's to distract the thugs from their escape or to knock one of them out or anything, he doesn't know. But it ends up being the right call, as the ball connects with the horsey through one of the gaps in the rope net, sucking the little mon into it and out of the net. Ash sprints for the river as the thugs all scramble to try and grab the ball as it rolls away from them towards the water. With the thugs all getting in each other's way, the ball rolls off the edge and into the water, just as Ash dives in after it. With Ash being downstream of the ball, he's able to spot it drifting through the water towards him. Swimming against the current, he manages to meet the ball halfway, taking it in his hands before swimming back up to the surface. Emerging from the water's depths, he breathes great lungfuls of air before he begins to paddle towards the bank. It's a bit of a struggle. He's tired from swimming against the current and he's only able to use one hand to swim, with the other holding the Pokeball. He's being pulled further downriver, even as he struggles to reach the bank. Then, Toti is next to him, grabbing his shirt and his teeth and pulling him towards the bank. Soon after, he's joined by Azzy, who begins pushing against Ash's back. Together, they manage to get him back to land before the river is able to drag him further away. Soaked through and exhausted, Ash can't help but hope that his dad never hears about this. He'd never be able to leave the house again. He also vaguely wonders if he's going to get sick from this. He's brought out of his musings by Marina covering him with a big tail. Looking up, he winces as he sees the worry in her face. She explains that the thugs ran away after he dived in after Horsey. She lightly scolds him for diving in like that and not checking how strong the river's current is, but she still tells him good job for saving the Horsey. Remembering the little seahorse Pokemon, Ash quickly brings it out of the Pokeball. The little guy shakes his head before he looks around nervously. The moment he sees the two kids, he instantly relaxes, smiling at his saviors. Ash apologizes to Horsey for catching him like that, explaining that he'd panicked and just thrown a Pokeball without thinking. He understands if he wants Ash to release him. To his surprise, however, Horsey doesn't seem all that upset with being caught by the raven. The little guy even shoots him a don't you dare look when Ash offers to release him. He then rubs his head against Ash's chin affectionately. Ash breathes a sigh of relief, glad that the little seahorse isn't upset over the accidental catch, and even seems quite happy to leave things as they currently are. He brightens even further when Marina points out that this means he now has a water type for the entry task. Over the next few days, Ash takes time to get his new teammate, now named Haku, acquainted with Vixie and Sil, figuring out what moves Haku has and working on a strategy for the first gym. When Ash feels that they're finally ready to take on the pewter gym, he goes up to the building with his Pokemon and best friend beside him. 
When he enters, the one to greet him is a young man who looks like he's in his early 20s. The boy turns to them with a welcoming smile, greeting them kindly and asking if they're both here to challenge the gym. Marina answers for both of them, explaining that she's already got a boulder badge, surprising Ash, who asks when she got a boulder badge. A little before we met, didn't I mention that? No. No, you did not. Marina gives an embarrassed chuckle as Ash asks if she's trying to go for the Pokemon League. Marina shakes her head, explaining that her goal is simply to battle strong trainers. It just so happens that strong trainer and gym leader tend to overlap. They are brought back to the present by a polite cough from the man, who then explains the pewter gym entry task before asking if Ash has a Pokemon with a type advantage against Rock. Ash nods before calling out Haku to show the man. He nods in approval before stepping aside to let the two pass. However, before the duo can take more than a few steps toward the field, their way is blocked by a teenaged girl with auburn hair and a teenaged boy with light brown hair. The two glare at Ash, asking if he's really planning on taking on Brock with just his tiny little seahorse. This gym doesn't have a pool, so just how does Ash expect his little horsey to move around the field? The girl huffs and tells Ash that he's a million light years away from being able to take on her brother. Before the two can continue their hazing of the raven, a stern older voice speaks up behind them. Billy, Tilly, what have I told you about trying to scare off challengers? The teens jump with startled squeaks before turning around to face the man walking up behind them. He's pretty tall and looks to be only a little older than Ash's father. The twins, Billy and Tilly, nervously tell their older brother that they weren't trying to scare anyone off. They just don't want Brock wasting his time with weak challenges. Brock shoots his youngest siblings a disappointed look, telling them that it's not up to them to determine who's worthy of challenging his gym. In fact, he's extremely disappointed in them for even thinking like that. It's a gym leader's duty to test anyone that comes to their gym in hopes of encouraging growth in the challenger. How is he meant to do that if all of the trainers that need that inspiration are being chased off by his own siblings? Billy and Tilly look at the floor, thoroughly abashed. With his lecture over, Brock turns to the two newcomers. Recognizing Marina, he greets her with a smile, asking if she's lost her boulder badge and come to battle for a new one. Marina puffs her cheeks out in a pout, muttering that she's not that forgetful. Then, she brightens and places her hands on Ash's shoulders, telling Brock that his challenger is actually her friend and gives Ash a little push towards the older man. Brock's eyes widen the tiniest bit for a fraction of a second before he gives a welcoming smile to the raven-haired ten-year-old. Welcoming him to his gym, he introduces himself before asking for his challenger's name. Ash Ketchum, from Pallet Town. Brock smiles, saying that it's nice to meet him before escorting him towards the field. As they walk, he asks how many badges Ash has, to which he honestly answers none. Nodding in understanding, Brock tells him that this will be a two-on-two -two match then. Once Ash takes his position on the trainer side of the field, while Brock takes his on the opposite side, they call out their Pokemon. Brock goes first, calling one of his Geodude who cracks his knuckles in anticipation. Taking his cue, Ash calls out Haku, who does his best to stand on his little curled up tail. Ash pointedly ignores the jeers from the gym leader's youngest siblings, while the brother that had been at the door and is now acting as referee calls the match to begin. The moment the battle starts, Ash calls for Haku to use smokescreen, blanketing the field in a black haze. Brock keeps his head, telling Geodude to use Tackle on Haku's last known location, as it's very unlikely that the little water type will have been able to move much on dry land. However, it turns out that this is just what Ash had been hoping for, as he calls for Haku to use Muddy Water, hitting Geodude at point-blank range. However, Geodude isn't a gym leader's Pokemon for nothing, and quickly picks himself back up before launching himself at Haku in a rollout. This time, instead of calling for an attack, Ash tells Haku to use agility to evade. In the stands, Billy and Tilly mock Ash's strategy, claiming that, even with agility, there's no way a horsey could evade Brock's Geodude, especially out of water. To their shock, however, Haku goes sliding across the ground, easily evading the rock Pokemon. It's only now that everyone realizes what Haku's attack had done to the field. The dirt and rock of the field are no longer hard and dry, but wet and slippery. Meanwhile, Geodude's heavy and hard body that usually makes him such a formidable opponent is now going to be a hindrance to him. 
Brock smiles, realizing that this must have been part of Ash's plan right from the start. Still, he's not about to just let the young trainer win. So, he calls for Geodude to continue using Rollout. At the same time, Ash tells Haku to use Smokescreen again. Once again, the field is covered in black. Now, the only thing that anyone can make out of the Pokemon is the sounds of them slipping around the mud and crashing into the rocks. However, it's almost impossible to tell which Pokemon is causing which noise and when. The only hint being the slight difference in sound between the scaly horsey and the stone geodude crashing into the rocks. After another moment, Ash hears the sound of rock against rock. When the sound is not immediately followed by the sound of squelching coming from that direction, Ash shouts for Haku to finish things off with Whirlpool. Instantly, the black smoke begins to be sucked up into the vortex of water, revealing the two Pokemon. Horsey is covered in scrapes and bruises while Geodude is revealed to have crashed into a particularly large rock and gotten himself stuck. Spotting the Whirlpool, Geodude frantically attempts to extract himself from the rock to no avail. With the Whirlpool fully charged, Haku sends it at Geodude. The moment the attack is within range, the strong pull of its vortex is enough to dislodge the rock type from the rock and pull him in. Geodude spins in the swirling mass of water for several minutes before the whirlpool dissipates, leaving Geodude to crash to the floor, his eyes now spiraling. Ash cheers on a happy Haku, while Brock recalls Geodude. Smiling, he compliments the younger boy on his strategy, but reminds him that this battle isn't over yet. With that, he calls out his ace, Onyx. Wanting to capitalize on their momentum, Ash calls for Haku to use Whirlpool again. However, just as Haku launches the attack, Brock calls for Onyx to use Bide. Hearing that, Ash lets out a quiet, oh no. Knowing that it's far too late to call back the Whirlpool, Ash instead calls for Haku to follow up with Muddy Water, just as the Whirlpool hits Onyx, hoping to knock the Rock Snake out before he can unleash his Bide. Haku does just that, unleashing another torrent of brown, murky water at his opponent. However, before the attack can land, Onyx unleashes Bide, the stored energy erupting in the form of a beam of white light that cuts through Haku's muddy water and knocks the little seahorse flying. Watching his friend fly through the air, Ash backs up a few steps so that, when Haku begins to fall back to the ground, rather than hitting the concrete or rock that make up the battlefield's edge, he instead lands in Ash's arms. When the little ball of blue lands, Ash is able to see the swirls in his eyes that are a clear indicator for a knockout. Smiling, Ash thanks Haku for his hard work before returning him. With that done, Ash reaches for his final Pokemon and calls out Syl. The Silver Eevee's teal eyes blaze with determination as he appears on the field. Wanting to end the battle before Ash and Syl can regain any ground, Brock calls for Onyx to use Bind. Nodding in understanding, Onyx begins to move through the mud of the field with the ease of a barboach, much to the shock of Ash and Syl. Quickly, Syl attempts to get out of the way of the tearing mass of stone, only to slip in the mud and fall over. Ash gives a startled shout of concern as it seems that his plan to help Haku move around the field is now coming back to bite them. Until he gets an idea. Turning to Syl, he calls for him to use Mud Slap. Scooping up a big lot of mud with his tail, Syl lobs it at the charging Onyx, hitting him right in the face. The shock and pain causes Onyx to flinch, sending him off his original course and missing Syl completely. With Onyx no longer bearing down on them, Ash calls for Syl to get onto the rocks. With a determined cry, Syl jumps onto the nearest rock, getting him out of the slippery mud just in time to avoid another launch from Onyx. Looking closely at the rock snake, Ash can see that there's still mud smeared over his eyes, obscuring his vision. This gives Ash an idea, and he calls for Syl to get to the rocks that make up the walls of the battlefield. Nodding in understanding, Syl does just that, using his grey coat and Onyx's obscured vision to evade the Pokemon's attacks. When he reaches the wall, Ash calls for him to get up high. Breathing heavily, Syl climbs the rock until he's right near the top. Once he's there, Ash calls for him to use Double Kick. Taking a deep breath, Syl uses the first kick to launch him off of the wall and over the Onyx. Then, once he's over the Pokemon's head, he lets gravity pull him down, and buries the second kick into Onyx's rock-hard head. 
there's a large splash of mud as Onyx's head is shoved into the field from the force. And when it clears, Onyx is lying motionless on the ground, his eyes spiraling, still standing victoriously on his head. The brother referee calls the battle, announcing Ash as the winner. Ash smiles, a warm sense of pride filling him. This feels... nice. He turns to Syl, preparing to help his best friend down from the Onyx, only for his heart to freeze in his chest as Syl stumbles, his eyes falling closed. Ash runs to his best friend as he falls from Onyx's head. And that, everyone, is where I'm going to leave the story for now. Join me next time as we find out what's happened to Syl, and Ash and his friends continue on to Mount Moon. I'm Rune, see you next chapter.